And welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded fund. I'm your host, Bob Fazzani, two of the best and brightest in the investing world with us today here. I'm joined by Matt Bartolini. He's the head of Spider America's Research. He's over at State Street. And Kevin O'Leary, Shark Tank co-host and O'Shares chairman. Kevin, uh, let me start with you. A lot of people over the weekend, I get these emails. I call them four exclamation point emails. People who are baffled and a little bit angry about the rally in the markets. Only, what, 12 percent from the S&P highs at a time when we're near depression levels uh, on the economic data. Can you just help square this for us? Uh, what's your take? Is the market mistaken and, and delusional or is the market properly looking ahead to uh, the idea that things are going to get better? What, what's the right way to, for people to look at this? Bob, I think it's the latter. I, I think what's assumed in, in the market's outlook, obviously being a forward mechanism, it tries to figure out at what point earnings will normalize. But, you know, since the last, let's go back to the health aspect first. SARS was over 10 years ago. Science has advanced so much that I'm optimistic even that we'll get some kind of therapeutic, if not inoculation, in the next 24 months, 18 months, uh, because the science is so much better. But what's really remarkable about this, this cycle, and the, and the reason I think equities are doing so Uh, I think we just lost Kevin there. But l let me just take this whole thing up uh, with you, Matt. I mean, you're a big watcher here. I wanted to talk about ETF flows recently. I'm gonna get, we're going to bring Kevin back in a minute and get his, his final take on this. But what I've been watching here is uh, I think two trends are really interesting in what's going on with ETFs, and it may be related to coronavirus. The first thing that we've been seeing is more ETF closures than openings this year. I don't remember when that's ever happened. Some of these are these leverage and inverse ETFs that are closing because of uh, uh, unusual activity that's going on there. But also I noticed we're still getting money coming in. There's still overall inflows. Dollar amounts are still positive, but most of the money is still going to those mega cap S&P 500 funds, including your, your own fund, the S&P index fund, the IVV, uh, that we're getting in, inflows there. AGG, the biggest bond uh, uh, fund uh, w that you run as well, iShares uh, bond fund, uh, still getting inflows. What do you make of these flows and, and the closures? And do you think some of this is, might be related to the uh, the coronavirus and how it's impacted ETF investing? Yeah, I mean, as far as closures versus launches, I think it's more about uh, openings have slowed. Uh, if you're looking to start to launch a product say sometime mid-February, is becoming very hard. And then in March, it became nearly impossible given two aspects. Uh, seed capital was more difficult to come by given the constraints on balance sheets, both from institutions and banks. Secondarily, mobilizing the team to go and have discussions with investors about a new product during a pandemic is extremely difficult, but also unlikely to yield any results given what we we're dealing with. Everyone was working from home. And you're really more concerned about how to actually get through your day than maybe thinking about a new investment strategy. So for a lot of firms, the decision was to postpone. So I'd expect actually a ramp up of launches uh, that are sitting on the shelf uh, that will come out in the second half of the year. Hopefully, as those two variables I discussed earlier, change as our society begins to reopen and get back to something close to normal. Closures are not a surprise. I mean, if you're planning on closing a poor, perfor poor performing fund before this, the events over the last few months made it extremely easier, and it became just an operational experience. Uh, with respect to fund flows, yeah. every major asset class category monitored has had inflows in April, which to me is just a sign of steadfast usage of ETFs and desire by investors to allocate capital across a variety of asset classes so as not to miss out as any gains as the global capital markets rallied. But is that really what's going on, Matt? I, I mean, it seems to me like the money flows are going into the biggest cap names, basically S&P 500 funds like yours, IVV, Vanguard Total Stock still getting big inflows, Triple Q still getting uh, inflows. That's where most of the money is going. Everything, if, if you look at there, there's like 15 funds that had the vast majority of the of the inflows. Investors still seem to be, my point is, they're still buying in to the idea of, of indexing as, as the way to go. And so the, the bigger ones are getting bigger and bigger and the, the, the smaller ones still aren't really partaking in any bigger part of the yeah. pie. Yeah, I mean, the bigger funds, they're more liquid, right? So SPY, our S&P 500 ETF, they have garnered a significant amount of assets during this pandemic as it started in February. Investors sought out liquid vehicles to allocate capital. But even in April last month, you know, while some broad data products did have inflows, I would actually say, you know, 
I would argue that investors are actually being more selective and picking their spots on how to buy back this rally because we saw $15 billion of inflows into sector ETFs in April with basically healthcare and tech, so XLV, XLK, those mm-hmm. funds having the most flows on record in a given month because investors were indiscriminately picking out areas of the market that would perform best during a period of a sluggish earnings earnings growth, but also economic growth, uh, where those firms' products and services are likely to be sought after. Yeah. Uh, speaking of picking your spots, I continue to watch in amazement the gold funds, including yours, the, the, the you know, Spider Gold shares, the IAU there is the symbol there, as well as GLD, your competitor. The money just keeps going into these funds. What's What I find interesting is gold for investment purposes. I want to own gold uh, and I want to have an ETF, you know, keeping it in a vault somewhere. Gold for investment purposes is way up. And yet, Gold demand for jewelry in India and China is way down. The World Gold Council acknowledged that. So it's kind of strange. You got you got the doom and gloom crowd out there saying, OK, I want to hold gold as a, you know, uh, as a bulwark against uncertain times. But jewelry demand, which is the other really major part of this whole equation, is 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 way down. Can you square that for us, too? Yeah, so, I mean, our product, GLD, uh, had significant inflows as well as its sister fund, GLBM. Uh, but the broader category had $7 billion of inflows in April. And that's really large. And I think it's worth pointing out that gold ETF AUM as a share of global ETF assets is still well below its peak of 9%. So there's been strong investment demand as a result of a supportive macro environment, given that real interest rates are low, uh, extremely low, and potentially negative based on what variable you're looking at. But also macro risk is high. Now, how do you sort of you know correlate that with the demand from jewelry? It has obviously waned. Uh, it's, it's unclear whether jewelry demand lost during COVID is lost or simply delayed to the end of 2020. Uh, if jewelry weakness persists for the longer term as opposed to a short shock, you know, that may weigh on gold over the long run. However, that's not our base case outlook. Uh, the macro forces at play, as discussed earlier, are still supportive for gold. And I think, broadly speaking, look at historically, investment demand has somewhat outweigh jewelry demand as a sort of a driver of price, just given the macro forces at play. Yeah. And uh, sorry, I mixed that up there. GLD, obviously, is your fund uh, and IAU, uh, the other one there. Sorry, I mixed that up there. Uh, Kevin, you're back. So let me just go back to you and, and finish your major point that we started off with. We were asking why people were we were asking if people were still angry about why the market's up so much. You you think that the market is correctly looking ahead to uh, the reopening and do better days ahead. Pick up your thought there. Well, institutional demand for equities is unprecedented given there's very other, very few choices. The, the average bogey of a, take a CalPERS, they've already gone public this year saying they're bogey 7%. Sovereign funds in Dubai or Riyadh, 6%. So if you think about how you're going to do that, your fixed income option of government bonds in the U.S. used to be something you'd even consider. Those, that's not longer, no longer an option at, at 60 to 70 basis points for a 10-year. That's not really going to be very useful. And so if you could find a company, and certainly there's many now that are yielding 25 to 3.5% div yield, large cap liquid securities, you know, that's a very attractive place to park money for the next 24 months. And you're seeing a tremendous demand for it across the board. It's not the retail investor that's driving this market. It's institutional. I speak to them every day. And they're saying, what other choice do I have if my bogey over the next 12 months is 6%? There is no other choice, Bob. It's that easy. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I've noticed, I want to talk about one of your, your funds. I've noticed these big inflows into the mega cap funds here, the Vanguard, mega cap growth, um, some of these other ones uh, that are out there, S&P 500, one, the S&P 100 ETF. A lot of this seems to be the interest in big cap that I was talking with Matt about, but there's also seems to be a lot of interest just in buying into the Internet stocks that are going to really uh, do well in this environment. Obviously, we've seen Amazon and Apple uh, and Facebook do well. You've got one, OGIG, one of the O shares, the global Internet giant. I was just looking at the inflows the other day, quite phenomenal uh, in the last couple months. What, What do you think is going on with that? And tell us how that fund is doing. Well, what that fund does is realize that the fangs are not unique to our own domestic market. There are companies all around the world, over 50 of them, that are experiencing tremendous growth as a result of what this whole pandemic has done to global retail changes. I mean, people's propensity to buy online is not just domestic anymore. We went into this at 16.2% online sales 
pre-pandemic, I think we're coming out at probably 24. So OGIG is not market cap weighted. So, you know, the, the trouble with a lot of different indices is they're market cap weighted. So the FANGs represent 40, 44 percent. But the FANGs are not the fast growing Internet stocks anymore. You can find all kinds of companies like Zoom, like DocuSign, like JD, all kinds globally. And that's what's captured inside of OGIG. It's up 21 percent year to date, Bob. It's our best performing uh, index, but it, it's captured the theme that I think is going to stay intact for the next three years. People are going to keep buying online, and these are the global Internet giants encapsulated inside of OGIG and not market cap weighted. So you get lots of all of the stocks that are performing well, not just the fangs, which are included in OGIG, but they're not 44 percent of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, this is a debate that's been going on for many, many years. Sometimes you get lucky. Like if you look at the look at the biotech stocks today, you, you see the, 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 the two biotech ETFs, IBB and XBI. One is market cap weighted. The other is basically equal weighted. And they're both at new highs. But that doesn't happen a lot. Usually equal weight or market cap weight does a little bit better. And we recently market cap weighted in tech has done a lot better. So that's a very good point, Kevin. Thank you. Um, Matt, uh, there's a lot of bottom fishers out there. I never ceases to amaze me. We were talking last week about the inflows into jets. This is the uh, global airline ETF. It's essentially a basket of U.S. airlines. There are some international ones in there. But the inflows have been titanic in the last uh, few weeks. Inflows into XLE, which is the energy ETF. You think like you think people would realize now picking a bottom and this is a is a fool's game. And yet we're still seeing it. Uh, the, the urge to pick a bottom uh, does not go away, and you can see it very clearly in the behavior of some of these ETFs recently. Yeah, I mean, as I always say, trying to pick a bottom in energy stocks requires a steel stomach, and we are seeing basically that play out right now. I mean, that's what the flow trends are telling us. Uh, in February and March, we saw strong inflows in energy sector ETFs, but those flows were from investors wanting to go short. Short interest on XLE climbed to around 20% of its assets. But here's where the bottom calling comes in. Short interest has declined since then, and it is now just around 11%, but the inflows into energy sector ETFs haven't stopped. There's, there was about $1.1 billion in April, right as the sector rallied 30%. We are seeing some of the same trends within those airline and energy commodity ETFs you mentioned as well. Those strong flows alongside declining short interest point to bullish optimism on some of the more beaten up spaces like energy. And as we said earlier, you know, you take those trends along with inflows in the sectors with strong earnings like healthcare and tech, and to me, it shows that investors are picking their spots and buying the rally. Yeah, Kevin. Um, other than uh, internet stocks, uh, and I know OGIG is very involved in that. Is there anything else you're particularly enthusiastic about? Give us some guidance of what you're thinking is on. on, on let's look six, eight months down the road towards towards Christmas. What's what's the sectors that are going to outperform this year? Well, people that are trying to second guess the S&P 500 towards which companies are going to cut or reduce dividends. I mean, if you're an institution, and as we talked earlier, looking for a 6% bogey, you want at least 50% of that coming from the distribution of capital. So now quality really matters. Now you really care to cherry pick. And this is what I love about the actively managed ETF sector, which everybody poo-pooed only three years ago. Now it's actually doing its work very well because in the case of OUSA, the one I'm going to talk about that I own, that's 130 plus of the S&P, but the highest quality balance sheets, which generally speaking are higher and more unlikely to cut dividends. So if you're using OUSA as a dividend play, which many people are doing right now with north of 3% dividend yield, it's a very good place to hide in the weeds if you're trying to be an institution making 6%. This is a time to use actively managed ETFs that focus on things like quality if you're worried about companies that are going to fail or at least reduce dividend yields. And there's going to be plenty of them, Bob. You've been covering it now for weeks. And I think there are sectors that are going to come out of this much better, obviously, than others. Uh, virus stocks versus non-virus stocks. You know, I'm not loving Disney right now for obvious reasons, but there's lots of companies that have actually done much better inside of the S&P 500 that aren't as worried about the effects of long-term concern to the virus. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Uh, it's hard picking the winners and losers. And that's uh, generally thematic stocks are a, a little bit faddish to me. But the concept of quality in this environment, strong balance sheet, unlikely to cut the dividends, that makes 
imminent sense. That's a that's perfectly rational uh, investment ideology. If you if you understand what's going on there. Thank you, Kevin. That's a good point. Um, another noticeable trend to me, Matt, is sort of into America and out of the rest of the world here. Uh, there have been outflows in the largest European ETFs recently and some of the large uh, emerging market ETFs. Um, is this like a permanent trend uh, out of foreign investments in, more into the U- U.S. in terms of flows? It's not so much a permanent trend, but it is more recent. Uh, we've seen those fl- outflows pick up. Basically, non-U.S. equity-focused ETFs uh, lost about $19 billion over the last three months. Meanwhile, $57 billion has been deposited into U.S. targeted strategies, leading to a differential of $80 billion, which is extremely high and is one of the highest differentials we've seen in quite some time. And is really driven by the outflows into the non-U.S. equity, into out, out, of, out of the European-focused ETFs, uh, like you had mentioned, but also into some of the broad EFA strategies as well. And I think basically what investors are doing here, they're ostensibly following Warren Buffett's advice and just buying America. There's really no preference from investors to express a risk-on view overseas, given that the economic and fundamental foundations are not as strong as they are in the U.S. But, you know, weak performance, the constructive relative valuations of non-U.S. equity markets, and low levels of positioning, however, set up international to be a big contrarian call right now. But unfortunately, that was the same call for the last few years and has yet to pan out. I think investors do want to sort of step into that market, you know, based upon the conversation we were just having with Kevin, they're just focusing on firms with higher quality balance sheets that do trade at inexpensive valuations, maybe worth a flyer, just because they might have some more fundamental rigor to withstand yeah. any, any degradation in earnings and economic growth. Yeah, it seems to me, Matt, what's going on here is we've got two of the oldest games in the book. Investors are bottom fishing. That's an old game. And let the winners run. Momentum playing, as Kevin noted, with the Internet names, which have been winners uh, for so long. Guys, thanks very much. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. I'm Bob Pisani. And my thanks, of course, to Kevin and to Matt for joining us today. And thank you for watching. You can watch all of our latest videos right here on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. We'll see you next Monday, same time, same place. Everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter, your weekly update on the hottest trends in the nearly $4 trillion market of exchange-traded funds, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.